Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you here for the third in our Lauterfach Center lectures. And you know it's an odd coincidence. They are called the Lauterfach Center lectures. And who do we have? Sir Elihu Lauterfach here today. As you all know, he is the founder of the center. But the history of his name in relation to international law in the University of Cambridge goes back longer, reaches back even to the period of his own birth. Because today Ali has presented to us um, <coughs> the doctoral degree in law originally granted to his father, Sir Hirsch Lauterpach. And um, I think we are all very pleased and proud to have received this and will exhibit it proudly in the centre. So this is Hirsch's first degree. Of course, he had several others, uh, including uh, a doctorate in political science from the same university and later an LAD from this university, um, a degree that Ellie himself has recently obtained from this university. As you know, Eli, uh, also Elihu, combines uniquely a number of features that make international law special. International law is special because in the ordinary run of things, you will find that those who do international law, and by international law I mean proper international law, not money law, but public international law, those who practice in that area tend to be the nicest kinds of people you could possibly encounter on this planet. Now, wherever you go around the world where you meet public international lawyers, inevitably, at some stage, they have studied under Eli Lauterpa. Remember Judge Schwebel, the uh, sometime president of the International Court of Justice himself, a figure of quite considerable and senior standing, he was one of Ellie's very first students who recounts very fondly how he was supervised by Ellie in Trinity College uh, many years ago. And it is typical of Ellie that wherever you go, you have those whose career somehow started with Ellie giving them the crucial impetus, the crucial kick upwards on the ladder to start their career. Um, we recently had occasion to celebrate not only his 80th birthday, but some years afterwards, was it your 60th year of practice at the bar? Um, Ellie is now, I think, in his 62nd year of practice. Um, so for all of you who are just about to qualify, you can see that the career as an international lawyer is a long one and an intellectually and in other ways rewarding one. Um, but he has had contact with, has administered, has run, has had a leading role in all of the functions that we could possibly imagine. He obviously is one of the keenest sought after advocates and counsels before, in particular, international courts and tribunals. As soon as there's a sniff or whiff of an emerging international law case, there's a race towards the three, four or five leading public international lawyers to sign them up before the other side does so. And generally speaking, it will be Ellie's telephone that rings first. That one wants to make sure to be represented at this kind of high level. Ellie has been counsel advocate um, in a large number of ICG proceedings and other important international cases. He himself has sat as arbitrators in a number of ad hoc and even standing tribunals. And he has served as a judge ad hoc on the International Court of Justice. In terms of his scholarly work, well, you're all familiar with his important book on the International Administration of Justice, his numerous other writings. He has edited five volumes of collected papers of his father, Sir Hirsch Lauterpacht, and only recently <coughs> he has published uh, an excellent and much internationally noted biography of his father. So all in all, I think, 60 or more years of practice reflected in an amazing, amazing range of achievements. And for us, of course, the most significant achievement is this very building here, is the Lauterbach Center that bears his name 
and rightly so, because he founded it as a basis for international law in this university, in this country, and worldwide. Elliot gives me great pleasure to hand the floor over to you in your own home. Well, you are all very kind to be here. Uh, I must say, uh, I have never seen this room so full. And as I <coughs> ponder on the situation, I can see no good reason for it except a love of antiques. But uh, <laughs> the fact is that before I came here, oh. before I came here, I had the advantage of looking in the Times today, and uh, there was a useful article, What England Should Do to Avoid Another World Cup Snore Draw. And uh, the valuable information in it was uh, that... Uh, I'm not surprised, says the author of this little article, that players take caffeine before kickoff. A shot of caffeine an hour or two before endurance exercise, like running, cycling, or football, has been shown to improve stamina and is widely used in a variety of disciplines where caffeine isn't banned. And so I'm hoping that the caffeine that I took an hour or so ago <laughs> will see me through the, the session. Uh, I must admit to being a little bit embarrassed by an episode that uh, focuses on me so uh, personally. Uh, I should be talking about myself. And I doubt if you will get any great substantive knowledge from what I'm about to say, but it may... Uh, amuse you to hear about little episodes. Uh, Cambridge has been a centre of international law for a long time, not simply uh, on account of my father or myself, but <coughs> we've had um, uh, Arnold McNair here for some years, and uh, he was a very great man. Uh, you will see his name, you will have read some of his work. He was a a man of special character, of, of great uh, moral rectitude, and uh, at the same time, humility and restraint. And uh, he, he was a shrewd man. I remember he called me in once in his 80s, and he said to me, Ellie, he said, I, I want to sell my library. How do you suggest that I should do it? My reply was, Oh, you shouldn't be selling your library after all. It's so much part of your life. To which he responded, oh, Don't you worry about me. I've already sold one library. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so we've had, we had uh, uh, McNair here, and subsequent to him, uh, Robbie Jennings, and then there have been other distinguished people like uh, Clive Parry, whose name should not be forgotten, and likewise, Court Lipstein, who lived to the age of 96 or 97, and some of you may have had the pleasure of seeing him in the library. Well, I will divide my approach to recollections into little bits, and I'll start with people. I've mentioned McNair. One name that sticks in my mind, because he was a rather impressive person, is that of Henri Rollin, R-O-L-I-N, who was a Belgian international lawyer, and my contact with him occurred during the Barcelona Traction case, which is a case of some notoriety. And uh, uh, he was the leader of the team, then being over 80, and his, his vigour and the concentration were much to be admired. There are other international lawyers who also ought to be mentioned from Cambridge, of which one is Jenks, uh, C.W. Jenks, Wilfred Jenks, who uh, left Cambridge and went straight away into the service of the International Labour Office in Geneva and gradually moved up through the legal division of that organisation until he eventually became Director General which was a, a great achievement and a recognition 
or the fact that his contribution was more than merely legal, but he was a, a progressive and creative thinker and a first-class international draftsman. Uh, <clears throat> another name, not a Cambridge name, but one associated with us through his writings, is that of uh, the late uh, Shabtai Rosen, whose book on the International Court of Justice is uh, of such uh, splendor. And he died only uh, a, a few months ago at the, I think he was aged 96, still writing. So he's a, he's a great man. So my recollections cover a lot of people. But I want to move on now to my own involvement in academic matters. <clears throat> I confess I've never written a major textbook. Uh, that was perhaps a mistake, but uh, I didn't have the, the stamina, vigor of, of other people, of which one is upstairs, James Crawford, who is remarkable for his literary as well as his, as his professional achievements. But uh, I, I recall that my father was anxious uh, in his later years that I should take over the editing of Oppenheim after he ceased to edit it. And my attitude was really rather cheeky. I said, oh, I, I'll write my own book. I don't want to edit somebody else's book. Net result was I didn't edit Oppenheim and I didn't write my own book. <laughs> but uh, and that, that's how it went. Uh, I've, I've written a number of smaller pieces, one of which I'm quite proud because it was a, an early analysis of the legal basis on which the State of Israel came into existence. And that was called Jerusalem and the <coughs> Holy Places, which I wrote in about 1967. Another uh, academic contribution was my creation of the British practice in international law. This was a, a series that I began in, I suppose it must have been about 1953 or thereabouts. And uh, it was intended initially as a uh, supplement to the International and Comparative Law Quarterly. And uh, that, that was quite novel in its time, uh, sufficiently novel to attract attention and insistence upon its regular appearance. And it was that regular appearance in which I failed because while I was away in Australia, something to which I'll come in due course, uh, it fell behind rather seriously. It was simply stolen uh, by uh, a group of British academics who might have known better, but in fact achieved something better. Uh, and it now appears uh, as the item ACMIL, UK Materials on International Law, in the uh, vo annual volumes of the British Yearbook, very well edited by Colin Warbrick and others, so I have no complaint to make. I just would like people to know that I had a hand in its creation. <laughs> uh, also, when my uh, father passed away in 1960, uh, I inherited the editorship of the International Law Reports, which I think are visible somewhere in here. And they, I'm glad to say, we've now reached volume 150. And uh, it's a very good series. It's suffering some uh, competition from an Oxford publication, of which happily I cannot recall the exact title. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, also, of course, access to material via the internet is now so easy that research is takes place on a, an entirely different plane. But in the preparation of the international law reports, I was initially helped by Gillian White, who then went on to become professor of international law at Manchester. And then she took a very sensible step. She got married and left. Uh, and she's now uh, in Australia uh, in the later years of matrimony. But uh, her place was taken in 1978 by Christopher Greenwood, who, uh, as you all know, is now, as uh, Sir Christopher Greenwood, the British judge at the International Court. 
and he, together with the the assistance of of Karen Lee, have continued to produce the series. Thank goodness, without any interference from me. Uh, in 1959 and 1960, I went off to The Hague to be the director of the English-speaking uh, section of the uh, a research facility at The Hague. In the period following each summer's series of lectures, there is a, a period of research in which there are two groups, English and French, of about two dozen members each, uh, under the direction of somebody. In, and in 1959 and 1960, that was myself, and we dealt with things like the law of treaties and the law of the sea. And it was, for me, a, a very encouraging experience because amongst those who were in the group were a number of Eastern European, Polish, Russian, and other international lawyers whose acquaintance with an understanding of international jurisprudence was very limited. And I was delighted that uh, in the course of those weeks together, they began to absorb the, the habit of re reference uh, to international cases as uh, a companion, if not a substitute, for uh, mere theory and uh, doctrinal research. And then uh, after the, oh, I went on, I keep on forgetting. Uh, I went on myself to give a series of lectures at the Hague Academy uh, on the development of the law of international organization through the decisions of international tribunals. Uh, and I wish that I expanded that into something uh, uh, firmer. Recently, as Mark has just told us, I prepared a biography of my late father, which was, a, for me, a psychologically cathartic exercise, because it was really about my relationship with him. He was an excellent father, and obviously had made his mind up that I should be an international lawyer at a very early age. And so from I think the age of 12 or 13 onwards, I was receiving letters with um, instructions as to what I should be reading. <laughs> and uh, there was an awful lot of it. And I'm sure that some of it did me some good. And then he nursed me along. Uh, I, I um, managed to get into Trinity and I did my undergraduate studies and then the what is now the LLM. And um, very quickly was able to move into a, a more, more practical fields because at that time there had been established, I'm now talking about 1950, and of course that must seem to you to be centuries ago. I mean, we're talking about things that happened 60-something years ago. And if I look backwards from when I started 60 years, that takes me back almost to Napoleon. <laughs> but, uh, 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 I got an early foothold. I was appointed as joint secretary of a committee on state immunity that had been established by the Foreign Office and the Cabinet Office to look into that subject, having regard to the public uh, <coughs> distaste at the decision of a court of appeal in the case of Kraina versus the TASS news agency. Uh, the chairman of that committee was uh, Sir Donald Somerville, a Lord Justice of Appeal, a man of very strong uh, temperament, if I could put it that way, who um, just uh, decided he would write the report, not, not the secretaries. And his approach was regrettably rather limited. So we ended up with a report limited to diplomatic immunity and only some aspects of it, but one important aspect, namely that of introducing into English law the freedom for the executive uh, to, to uh, retaliate if foreign governments limited the immunity enjoyed by our own personnel in their countries. And uh, we didn't really touch 
on the state immunity at all. But for me, it was a, a, a very interesting experience. And that was, that heralded uh, my uh, entering chambers in London as a pupil. That was in November 1950. And I had as my pupil master an admirable person called John McGaw, who later became Sir John McGaw and a, a, a judge of the Court of Appeal. Uh, and from him, I learnt, uh, and it was an important piece of learning, uh, the skill in drafting technical material in a clear and understandable fashion. Uh, I was very glad of that, and I was his pupil for, for two years, and then I was admitted as a, a member of those chambers. They were then three Essex Court, of which I'm still a member, even though they moved from Essex Court to Essex Street. And while I was with uh, John McGaw, <coughs> there came into his uh, list of items to work on uh, a, a brief about a, a boat called the Rosemary. Uh, the Rosemary was a, a, a tanker uh, that had picked up oil in Iran and was carrying it to Europe. Now, as background to that, you have to be aware uh, that in 1950 or 51, the uh, Iranians had nationalized the oil industry, which meant effectively nationalizing BP, and no compensation was forthcoming. It was therefore uh, certainly prima facie, if not actually, a violation of interna international law. Now, against that background, BP had advertised in the press of the world saying, if anybody buys oil from Iran, uh, that derives from the area of our concessions, uh, then we will sue them for that oil. So here was the little Rosemary carrying a small cargo of oil from Abadan to possibly Italy, but its engines broke down and it got stuck and it had to put into port in Aden that was then a British colony. And so without hesitation, and with all due speed, uh, BP sent John McGaw out to Aden to administer the, the legal proceedings being brought against the ship and its charterers for the detention of the oil. But John McGaw, uh, wise man though he was, did not actually know any international law. And indeed, it's a reflection of the attitude of the bar at that time that... Uh, International law was not widely known and was rather looked down on, was disdained as a, a sort of academic, theoretical subject of no practical value. Well, luckily I was able to help him. I, I, I drafted notes for him and in the proceedings in Aden, subsequently reported in the weekly law reports, uh, he put forward the argument uh, that <coughs> oil derived from the Iranian fields in violation of international law uh, <coughs> could not legally be transferred to any other person. In other words, it was a case that uh, attacked uh, a very fundamental case in British private international law, namely the case of Luther against Segor. Luther and Segor was is, is authority for the proposition that when you're judging title to territory uh, to, to to objects possessions then uh, that title must be adjudged by reference to the law of the place where the goods were situate at the time of the questionable transfer in other words it was the, the lex cetus as it is known now if the Lex Cetus had been applied to the Rosemary situation, BP could not have recovered the oil because the Lex Cetus was Iranian law at the time of the transfer to the, the owner of the vessel. And so, uh, as I say, Luther and Sego would have been the end of the matter. But we managed to engraft onto Luther and Sego the very significant qualification that where the transfer even under the law of the place where the goods were situated, was contrary to international law, 
then international law precluded any other state or court from accepting its validity. And I'm glad to think that I had a, a, a hand in, in that development. And uh, in 1953, in the years following, it was, uh, well, first of all, it was very difficult for the English bar to accept it. And there were always, in, in the few cases that followed, uh, qualifications uh, by judges on, on the subject. But the idea spread, and uh, it, it was eventually applied in the United States. It was the foundation of the United States Alien Torts Act. So, <clears throat> as I say, that was uh, a, a very interesting uh, beginning to, to my career. Well, then, <clears throat> I think I started out this section of my talk uh, under the, the head of, of academic contributions, and I've geared off into practice. But as part of academic contributions, I'd just like to go back and mention the fact that in 1978, on my return from a three-year spell in Australia as the legal advisor of their Department of Foreign Affairs, I created a, a, a publishing company called Brochures Publications Limited. Why? because at that time the international law reports were being published by Messrs. Butterworths, a distinguished firm of legal publishers. But I think they were a bit disenchanted by my somewhat lackadaisical, or as they thought, lackadaisical approach to publishing schedules. And so uh, when, I, when they remonstrated with me, I said, well, if it's such a bother to you, I'll publish it myself. And so... I created Roach's Publications Limited, and we took over the publication of the International Law Report and made quite a success of it. And more than that, we also published other f works in the field of international law. Uh, I recall that at the time of the, it must have been the Iraq crisis, we managed to produce a, a document book in six weeks. Uh, <coughs> In most publishing houses today, six weeks would be the period which would be taken just to turn over the pages of the draft manuscript. <laughs> but uh, that was a success, and we went on and produced other books on international law until eventually a situation developed in which I had to choose myself between just becoming a publisher or continuing in my career in international law. And so, uh, I was able to dispose of Grocer's Publications Limited to the Cambridge University Press, uh, of whom the current and most effective representative is present here in the form of uh, Fanola O'Sullivan. And we're very grateful to them for keeping us going. I hope they'll be able to do so indefinitely. Then, still reverting to activity on the academic side. It was suggested to me in 1983 by the then uh, Hugh Professor uh, uh, Sir Robert Jennings and the man who became his successor, Professor Bowett, and Clive Parry, who was also here then, uh, that uh, we should have a center for international law, which I would uh, create and administer. Well, as you probably all know, m money is a useful uh, driving force in the creation and maintenance of such establishments, and we had no money. So the International Law Centre was centred in my study in my house in Herschel Road for some years, and it was all done from there uh, with the help of my secretary. And uh, initially, we used to... Uh, try and promote uh, research work. And one of the most significant products of our initiative has been the massive study on ICSID uh, prepared by Professor Schroyer of Jena, who was one of our uh, LLB students here in my early years and who has gone on to significant prominence in the field. 
So we established the what was then called the Research Center for International Law in 1983. We managed to acquire uh, the building behind you in 1986. When we bought it, it was unfortunately the most expensive house to change hands in Cambridge. <laughs> and at that time, it cost us 350,000 pounds, which was <laughs> a lot of money. But those of you who may have examined the Cambridge property market at the present time would realize that prices are now very much higher and a building like that would be in the, in the order of probably about a couple of million pounds. And then subsequently, with the benefit of a grant from the widow of Tom Finley, whose portrait hangs on the wall, we were able to build this extension and the upper floor of it, which we call the Snyder study room, was the uh, gift of Earl Snyder, an American Air Force officer who acquired an interest in international law and wanted to see it promoted. Uh, and then uh, some years later, uh, not due to any uh, initiative on my part, uh, is the name of the center was changed to Lodge Park Center uh, in acknowledgement, not of my role, but of my father's role in the advancement of international law in Cambridge. So uh, I can move on from academic to uh, some of the practical applications of international law within my recollection. And I use that phrase within my recollection because I probably have forgotten more than I remember. I've told you about the Rosemary and the, the train of developments initiated there. But I also then became quite involved in international law in the investment sphere. Uh, at that time, Shell and a number of other major international companies were very concerned about the development of international law and in particular of the rules relating to the protection of investment. And so an informal organization was established called API, the Association pour Promotion et Protection de, uh, des, des Investissements Internationaux. And uh, it was uh, based in, in Geneva, and the person who administered it was the late Michael Brandon, who was an old friend of mine and who had been up here with me. And Michael had set up as a lawyer in Geneva and was used by the companies to, to, to administer this scheme. And he very generously has, uh, having died sadly just a few months ago, has bequeathed uh, money for the creation of the Michael Brandon fellowships within this center. I don't know who are the current holders, but I wish them, but wish them well. And so I got involved in the work of API and drafting draft agreements for the protection of property. Uh, they didn't get very far, unfortunately, as such. But the basic idea was picked up by uh, Ronnie Broshes, the then general counsel of the World Bank in Washington. And he, showing great initiative, uh, moved around the world, encouraging states to subscribe to a draft convention that he had prepared on the protection of foreign investment, not by reference to the substantive rules, but by, by way of creating suitable jurisdictions in which disputes might be settled. So, uh, in due course, in 1956, I think it was, uh, ICSID, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, was established under the uh, auspices of the, the World Bank. And I was glad to have felt that I played some role in that. 
I've skipped one item which I have attached importance to, and that is my own participation in the solution of the nationalization dispute with Iran that I mentioned earlier. Because in 1954, I was one of the council of 14 of us uh, representing the principal oil companies who went out to Tehran to negotiate uh, a, a, an agreement for the settlement. And, and that agreement uh, was not only important in itself because it enabled the oil industry to be restarted in Iran, but it was important also as a precedent for many other international oil concessions. Uh, I myself was responsible for the drafting of the proper law clause with its reference to general principles of law and for the uh, arbitration arrangements. And these were subsequently incorporated in many other agreements. So I felt pleased about that. Well then, let me move on to, to litigation. Uh, as, as Mark indicated, uh, I have been involved in a lot of litigation. Uh, I'm glad to think that my involvement is now diminishing because uh, people rather uh, look at your date of birth and then wonder whether you can survive long enough to participate in an international case because they all take so long. Uh, I, I, I'll give you one illustration. In 1954, uh, this is an English case. 1954, I signed the statement of claim in a case between the East German and the West German Zeiss. A very interesting case. The case went through various procedural stages until at first instance it eventually came before the Court of Chancery in 1971. Some 17 years later, and <clears throat> was settled in the third week of the opening speech of the plaintiff's counsel. Why? Because in those intervening years, the political scene had changed entirely. In 1954, the relationship between East and West Germany uh, was very hostile. By 1971, thankfully, uh, things had changed for the better. So, uh, as I say, uh, people tend to look at the recruitment of counsel now by reference to date of birth <laughs> rather than anything else. Uh, <clears throat> there was a number of interesting cases, there have been many interesting cases in which I've been involved. Uh, one interesting one was the, the IMCO advisory opinion. I forget what year it was, but it, it was in the first year of the uh, establishment of that organization, the International Maritime Consultative Organization, now known as the International Maritime Organization. And in that year, uh, uh, there was a dispute at the very first session of the organization as to voting procedures and voting rights. And uh, there was a provision in the Constitution for the election of a certain number of members of the ship-owning nations. And some states took the view that to be a ship-owning nation qualified for treatment in this way, uh, you had actually to be a nation that owned ships. Whereas, as you know, there are a number of states, notably uh, Liberia and Panama, that are flags of convenience states. And the question was, whether they should be included in this category. And there was an advisory opinion sought, and I'm glad to say that the side uh, for which I acted, namely the flags of convenience states, prevailed, and their, uh, uh, their entitlement uh, to, to participate in the Maritime Safety Committee was acknowledged. I would, if I were able to go on indefinitely in this conversation, if conversation it may be called, uh, I, I would uh, have come to 
an observation uh, that, that may be of value to you, and that is the desirability of patience and restraint in handling of cases and in particular in actual international proceedings. In the IMCO case, one of the judges asked uh, the states who were appearing before the court uh, how many uh, tons of shipping were registered under the Liberian flag. Now that question was put not only to the flags of convenience states, but also to the states who were opposing their position. After a day or two, the uh, British representative got up and said, well, they didn't know how much shipping was registered under the Liberian flag, thus immediately placing themselves the British placing themselves in a position in which they were not entitled or qualified to exercise a discretion because they did not know the underlying facts. Now, my Liberian colleagues were ready to leap up and say, oh, but we know. And I said, just wait. Wait until the British have answered, and then you can answer, pointing out the defect in their response. So that was a matter of encouraging one's clients to be patient or restrained. Now, uh, I might pass on from there to the nuclear test case because they were interesting. Uh, in 1972, uh, Gough Whitlam uh, became Prime Minister of Australia. And with the assistance of Dan O'Connell, an Australian who was then the Professor of International Law at Oxford, uh, decided that Australia would initiate proceedings in the International Court with a view to stopping the atmospheric nuclear tests that were being conducted by France on the island of Mururoa in the Pacific. Well, the first problem was a jurisdictional problem. On what basis could the court's jurisdiction be invoked, and the uh, choice made was that of the uh, system of the uh, Permanent Court of Arbitration. No, I mean, that's not wrong. I a momentary lapse, uh, not the first, I may say, nor the last. Uh, <laughs> it was the General Act, that's it, sorry, the General Act for the Settlement of Disputes. Now, the General Act had been invoked by France in its own case against Norway in the so-called Norwegian Loans case and vigorously pursued by the French Council and legal advisor uh, André Gros. Now, by the time we got to the court in the nuclear test case, André Gros was sitting on the bench. And so uh, I was able to direct my argument in favor of the relevance and applicability of the General Act towards Grow. I'm citing what Grow had himself said <laughs> in the Norwegian Loans case. Grow did not like that at all. And so he manifested his dislike by visibly reading the newspaper. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he obviously did not like me. And uh, later on in 1979, it must have been, when I was elected to the Institut de Droit International at a time when Gro was president, a meeting was being held in Athens. Uh, the, the tradition in the Institut is that the newly elected member goes to the meeting and presents himself to the president, which I did. And Gro responded by saying, I am glad to meet your father's son. <laughs> our, our relationship did not prosper after that. Uh, there have been many other cases 
worth mention. I suppose one that might uh, just amuse you a bit is the Libya Malta case uh, uh, regarding delimitation in the uh, waters of the Mediterranean between the two states. And Libya, I mean, it was a prima facie case for the application of uh, equidistance, a median line between the two states. But Libya sought a line much closer to the Maltese coast, justifying that extended claim on the basis of the tectonic plates which underlay the ocean. And uh, their argument was that in due course these tectonic plates would uh, either act or separate, I can't remember which, in such a way as to justify their additional claim. They, they produced a, a memorandum by uh, two geologists from Holland supporting their position. And uh, so the geologists were put on uh, for, for exam cross-examination. And so I was cross-examining them. And my question to them was, uh, can you tell the court how long it might be before this development <coughs> took place and they said well maybe a few million years <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that, that resolved that issue <laughs> but as I say there have been lots of cases with lots to, to tell you about but uh, I think I had better pause at that point if anybody wants to ask any questions I'd be happy to try and answer them within the limits of of my capacity. As I entered the building today, I was asked how I was, <laughs> and I said, I am vertical, <laughs> vocal, and visible. <laughs> uh, the triple V to be known in the future. Uh, I'd be glad to help if anybody wants to ask any questions. Thank you very much.